Now, we're all familiar with the concept of plant life becoming sentient and aggressive to humans through the many horror or science fiction films and books on the subject. Their portrayal in films are at times graphically disgusting, but more often than not it's quaintly cheesy and even humorous. However, in the real world, the concept of predatory or parasitic plant life or fungus is all too horrifying. I've always been both equally repelled and utterly fascinated with parasites in the natural world, and the cordyceps fungus is one that's particularly repellent to me. Unlike some of the biological parasites out there, like the huge variety of worms, the cordyceps fungus just seems so alien. At least the worms are animals. This fungus is a microorganism with no central nervous system, yet it's still able to control the behaviours of other creatures, to make them act erratically, and ultimately use them as a tool to propagate. Humans too can be infected with the mind-altering parasite Toxoplasma, a single-celled parasite that changes the behaviours of various hosts like the snail or rats. It inhibits the natural self-preservation instincts so they can easily be caught by predators, the original targets for the parasite. There are estimates that a third of all humans on the planet are infected with it, and the results for the infected range from an increase of neuroticism, suicide rates, and even traffic accidents. It brings up an interesting philosophical thought of what makes us, us. If you are infected, are you sharing your personality with a parasite? Infected people may think their everyday actions are a result of their decision making, but in reality it may simply be a form of manipulation by the toxoplasma. <laughs> anyway, although the cordyceps fungus seems to be contained to the insect world, what if something similar was to happen to humans? Cordyceps fungus gets inside of the brain and controls these ants and mandibles start chomping, they grow up to higher areas, cordyceps fungus sprouts out and then it germinates. It essentially uh, uses them to spread the, its infection and take over whole colonies, sometimes wiping them out. As soon as we saw it, we were intrigued by the idea of what if it jumped to humans? So what would happen? How would people react? What would happen to society? As we're trying to develop the look of the infected, um, we went through so many different iterations, some that looked really alien and subhuman, um, some that looked just essentially like zombies, uh, and we couldn't find like an original place for them. But one of our artists uh, just did this kind of photo mashup where he took a bunch of images of diseases or images of fungal overgrowth, uh, and he kind of mashed it all together and he threw it on this person. And not just fungus growing on the head, but it's tearing the face apart, cleft down the middle, this gaping maw of a mouth with the crooked teeth. And fungus they have these beautiful saturated colors, and we really like that conscious of this something so horrific that it's gonna like stop at nothing, it's relentless force of death, and yet it, elements of it are beautiful. It's not just about gore. It's not just about everything about it being scary, because to us it's actually scarier when things on it are some, somewhat benign or somewhat beautiful. We went to great lengths to create a full biological cycle for these things. So in the early stages you don't actually see too many signs of uh, the fungus surfacing out of the skin. It's kind of underneath it, like people have lumps starting to show. The eyes will be kind of cloudy um, or lopsided because the fungus kind of originates inside the head. That moves into the next phase, which is the clicking phase. And if they mess with the eyes, we end up saying, well, how do they get around? Oh, echolocation. And they use a form of echolocation to track down their enemies. Uh, just like bats or even some blind people can see by making a clicking sound, a sound that on its own wouldn't be very scary. And then to associate it with something that people in this world are very fearful of, so that as you're exploring an environment, all of a sudden you hear this click and you're seeing everybody just get frightened, just everybody duck, everybody hushes. Perhaps the true horror of the clickers isn't just that they're incredibly aggressive and infectious, but that there may still be a remnant of humanity buried deep within these hosts to the cordyceps, in pain and with no control of their actions. It's an 
great agony as its humanity and its brain is still somewhat functional. You still have some hu human cognitive abilities or the thought process back here. This isn't some decaying corpse on the ground. This is a living thing that's going to be coming after you in the world. Like the common cold, I sneeze and I cough uncontrollably. Well, what if I want to like snap your neck or I want to like chew on you to like perpetuate this parasite? Yeah. When infected feels like it's going to die, it finds like a dark corner and it becomes part of the environment. The human elements aren't there anymore. And then the body is gone. They lay down and sprout and then spew spores. And if people can breathe those spores, they become infected as well. It all had to kind of make sense of how each stage flowed from one to the other. And that's hopefully how we've created a world that you can kind of look through it and understand the science behind it and say, I can buy this, I can get into this. Naughty Dog created an all too real world plausibility for the clickers, a refreshing change from the usual undead zombies.